Yeah. yeah. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a risk-sensitive energy procurement problem, which we solve with uncertain wind. This is joint work with Professor Bose. Now, to begin, why do we care about this problem? Well, forward energy procurement problems are solved all the time, whether it's an hour ahead, a day ahead, a month ahead, or even decades ahead. And these problems need to be solved based on some forecast. Um, traditionally, we, with low renewable penetration, these forecasts are actually fairly good. However, as we know, wind energy, even for very short periods of time, is highly uncertain. And in the future, we plan on adding a lot of wind energy. So it's important that we incorporate this uncertainty in our optimization models and learn how to solve and account for them when we solve our optimization problems. So to begin our forward procurement problem for the deterministic case in which we assume that our forecasts are near perfect is given by this problem. Here we assume that omega is some constant. Uh, if this is true, if the forecasts are fairly good, then solving this sufficient, I mean, the generation won't deviate significantly from the solution to this problem. So we know that it's approximately very close to feasible and uh, very close to being uh, optimal, which means we should be OK in terms of the operating point. However, as we increase our uncertainty in renewable generation, we must account for the fact that generators have to respond in real time. So our true dispatch in the real time will deviate significantly from a solution to this problem. Now, how do we remedy that? Well, we have to account for this uncertainty in our generation itself. To model that, we assume that the generator's recourse response is a linear function of the uncertain parameter omega. So we have some affine recourse policy. Now, when we incorporate these into our problem, we have stochastic objective and stochastic constraints. So we need to apply some kind of measure in order to optimize over this problem. Now, what we suggest using is the conditional value at risk. What is the conditional value at risk? Um, the conditional value at risk, parameterized by some alpha, measures the expected tail loss in the 1 minus alpha fraction of worst case scenarios. So what does that mean? If we have some fixed random variable, or we have a random variable, it has some kind of distribution, which we have given here. By setting alpha to some value, in this case, we set it to 0.95. This blue area here has a cumulative, uh, or it has a probability of 0.95, and this area here has a probability of 0.05. The C bar measures the expected value of this tail. Now, notice that alpha gives us a way to basically select how much of this distribution we care about. By taking alpha to zero, we consider the entire distribution, and we recover expected value. When we take alpha to 1, we only consider the worst case. So in this way, alpha gives us a tunable parameter to capture our willingness for constraints to violate those constraints and for the objective to take on high costs. Um, the last point I'd like to make is that we take, make use of this very useful formulation, which can be applied for any kind of loss distribution. Uh, so now returning back to our problem, applying our affine recourse policy, and incorporating our conditional value at risk to our objective and constraints, we arrive at the following problem. Notice that we have one single almost sure constraint. This is because our power balance constraint must be met, is physically enforced. So it doesn't really make sense to not be able to satisfy it. So because of that, we enforce it almost surely. The problem with this kind of almost sure constraint is that it's difficult to optimize over, because we must ensure that it's met for all criteria. However, with some clever, clever reformulation, which you can see in our paper, we can actually express this as a purely CVAR penalized, CVAR constrained problem of the following form. Now, making use of the definition of CVAR that we had from before, we can express this problem as a stochastic optimization problem purely in expectation. Now, why did we spend all this time converting our problem into this nice uh, stochastic optimization form. Well, thanks to some brilliant work by some two enterprising individuals, we have a recent paper to solve such problems. All right, I know, bad pitch, but um, which solves this using a subgradient primal dual algorithm. Now, what is this algorithm? 
Well, for completeness, it's stated here. It's a primal dual stochastic subgradient method. I'm not going to go into the details. If you want to see more about this, you can see the paper. Additionally, we've provided an implementation here. Um, so now, what makes this algorithm useful is that we've also provided some a theorem that guarantees convergence to um, convergence of the objective and convergence of the constraints. Now, notice that this is a stochastic subgradient method. What this means is that the iterates themselves are stochastic. So any guarantees we can provide have to be over some kind of measure. So in this case, we can only guarantee this in expectation. We cannot ensure that the, the fun objective function will converge um, asymptotically, nor can we converge that it will, uh, is guaranteed to converge. Now this guarantee is provided given the step size and the number of iterations shown here. These depend on parameters p1, p2, and p3, which are constants and can be found. For details, you can find that in our paper as well. But now that we model this, notice that the constraints depend on this parameter, the CVAR parameter beta, and the objective depends on the parameter alpha. Now, how does this, how do these parameters, how do the iteration count and the step size depend on this risk sensitivity? As one might expect, increasing risks makes it more difficult to optimize. As you can see, the step size decreases very rapidly. Additionally, the number of iterations required to solve this problem increases incredibly fast. In this way, we've kind of captured that risk, the, uh, that risk sensitivity makes optimization more difficult. And we provided a way to kind of visualize that. But now that we've seen this formulation, um, let's consider a simple example, a uh, simple two bus example, where each bus is equipped with some generation, uh, dispatchable generation, some wind generation, and some demand. And they're connected by a single line. Now, solving the problem we had from before, we can, and defining the following risk aversion parameters, where alpha denotes the objective cost, uh, beta L denotes the parameter associated with the line capacity constraints, and beta uh, G denotes the generation capacity limits. For the case when the risk aversion parameter associated with lines is increased, we can see that the worst case line violation decreases. Additionally, when dispatch cost is prioritized with a higher risk aversion parameter, the highest dispatch cost decreases as well. In this way, we have that the CVAR parameters provide a way to capture the trade-off between uh, our willing, or capture our willingness to accept constraint violation or high dispatch cost. Now, while this formulation is very nice in capturing this way, we have a, a very high iteration count. Now, this is a known problem for subgradient methods, uh, which is, it has a very high iteration count and a very high runtime as a result. However, in this formulation, we haven't, or in this uh, algorithm, we haven't taken advantage of any smoothness, which has been shown in other literature to provide much, much faster guarantees for convergence. And um, it's a lot shorter than I thought. <laughs> but, uh, so in this, formula, in this um, presentation, we provided a CVAR sensitive formulation that captures this trade-off or willingness to accept high costs or constraint violation. Uh, and then we proposed an algorithm to solve this uh, using a stochastic primal dual subgradient method, which we know to be, sh to be very slow. And in the future, we wish to speed this up by taking advantage of the smoothness of the parameters or some other techniques. Any questions? That was really short. Ten minutes. Yeah, what, can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was the bottom line of your uh, result here? Is this some kind of optimal dispatch or energy procurement? Energy procurement. So it's essentially economic dispatch where with uncertain net demand. Uh, that ninety megawatts up there, is that the actual flow or is that the max? Max. Rating. Yeah. You say worst case line. Uh, worst case constraint violation. So this is actually. Oh, that's what I thought, right? Yeah. So for the lines, we can see that as you prioritize line capacity, the worst case decreases. As you prioritize dispatch cost, dispatch cost decreases. But the 
worst case line violation is 25 megawatts? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? You're 25 over? Yeah. Or, yeah. 25 over or, yeah. Over the 90. Yes. And the reason is because, I mean, this is an artificial example to illustrate the point, but uh, wind, the wind capacity is very high compared to the does total this demand. What to do then? That's the idea. So the idea is you can't rely on your forecast, so how do you model that into your optimization problem? And so we model that in this, and we've seen that we can basically get an output that corresponds to our risk aversion parameters. That's a, you said energy, so you're, that involves time. This is some chunk that you're. We assume over a, uh, we're assuming over an hour. Over an hour. Yeah. So it's... It can be over any interval. It, it doesn't actually matter that much, but in this case, we've assumed over an hour. Anything else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what is the reason for that? And so, here, beta L is increased from 0 to 0 0.2. So, even for the constraints we're considering, we're not allowing for uh, as much line violation, which kind of makes sense that it'll decrease. Yes, but like from the network, mm -hmm. why does that happen? Is it because you take more power from? Omega one source and flip it to the low beam one and reduce the exchange. Oh, you're talking about what the response is? Yeah. Well, if you're if you're less willing to let this violate, it will start producing more energy from here to compensate. So does it mean that it will cost the customer more in terms of energy? Yeah. Because it would. So what would be the benefit? You reduce the violation and you ask the customer to pay more money for the electricity? Or well, so this is the point. Well, does it, are they guaranteed to pay more? No. Because what, they, what their customer pays is dependent on whatever wind is realized. So this is just a wind capacity. It's a random, it's something random that we don't know. It takes values between 0 and 40. Yeah. And this one takes some values between 0 and 20. So there are random variables that we don't know what value they're going to take. So there is a chance that they'll end up paying less. There's a chance they might end up paying more. But for a, yeah. The question is, there's less violation, does it mean that there's less, less power going from uh, the left side to the right side? Not guaranteed. No. Yeah. So the, remember the, the definition of CVAR, we only care about the tail. So less violation does not mean less is being transferred. All it's saying is talking about the tail. Here. Mm -hmm. That iteration count. Is that 10 to the 9? Yep. I mean, yeah. I never ran anything. <laughs> yep. It took, uh, if you look at the, the runtime, this took about, what is that? That's like. Error after that many <laughs> <laughs> we don't even get to that level of convergence. But uh, so yeah, it took like eight hours to run. One is what was talking about. When you do energy procurement, forward procurement, you are going to be successful. There is nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Nothing you can do to reduce the forecast as you do it. So one way to do it is just plain have some point forecast and then have very expensive reserves to compensate. <coughs> That's one way. The other is you plan forward for what uncertainty you might face and then uh, make sure you make this an automatic discount rather than having system operators come in and say, let's crank this up, let's crank that down, etc. It's automatically done at a forward stage. What is the recourse action you want to take? You plan forward. You don't wait for the uncertainty to show up. It's an automatic response to what you need. Makes sense? So you program that into it. Uh, this usually what happens if you look at the such dispatch uh, mechanisms, it's to internalize any uncertain decisions that you may have to take in real time that may be costly. You internalize it within the optimization problem, solve problems. You don't worry about it in real time at all. 
the system operators have can go away without touching the system based on this. Whatever uncertainty it is, you uh, take care of it in real time, but based on a decision you took much earlier. Make sense? So that's the first idea. That that's where the risk is. The second is the algorithm itself with the iteration comes. It has to be a little bit uh, clarified here. So one way of doing it is you sample multiple times and then you solve the optimization problem. That's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is you sample and move. So at every point in time, you have some dispatch and whether you have some guarantees over it is what we provide to the CRO. So this is basically, you, the reason of this entire thing is the following. These distributions are such that they are very weird distributions if you look at it. If the forward, the forward forecast uncertainty error, they are sort of like, uh, they are bimodal. It's not like a nice Gaussian error style uh, distribution. So, and usually getting some parametric form for these are high. So what people, one of the ways of doing it is you sample and then you move based on it. So the, there are two kinds of algorithms. One does sampling first and then run optimization based on the sample. We took a different view of things. We took sample and update at the same time rather than making it into two separate plots. How do you know the distribution? This is the wind. So we, we, in, in our case, we sample it. So we don't need to know the distribution at all. All we need to know is how does it, yeah. It's not quite distribution free because you still need, yeah. yeah. You don't rely on a parameter. Yes. But if it's 21,000 seconds to do that, yep. what, what if it was 10,000 buses? <coughs> That's why we are currently coming up with much better. I don't think DeepMind can solve that. You don't solve it. Yeah. So you, you take a different approach yeah. to solving the problem. I mean, subgradient methods are notoriously, um, have notoriously high iteration counts. Yeah. Uh, you're saying that taking advantage of this new risk. Mm -hmm. We have a couple, um, but we haven't really got anything fleshed out yet. It's still in the works. Subgrading, well, the rate of convergence typically is squared. So it's. So epsilon being the error tolerance, one over epsilon squared is the roughly the order in which number of iterations you take for not smooth. For smooth, it's one over epsilon. So, order yeah. mm -hmm. so, a weird question. Is this the sort of problem that a quantum computer would be good at solving? Do you know? So, my understanding is that quantum computers are typically good at solving simulated annealing problems, okay. which this is not an example of. Okay. But again, I don't know that much about it, so. Yeah. But my understanding is it's good for like probability distribution stuff. And this says probability distribution stuff. Yeah, so my understanding is that it's a, like an energy loss kind of thing, okay. which I suppose, I don't know if you can formulate this in that way, but I, mean, I know don't know. About it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I work with real computers. So far. <laughs> Quantum ones. So yeah, hard. I have no idea. <laughs> it's a good question though. Yeah. Anybody else? Cool, thank you.